Hi folks, Patrick Rail here from the Ludica blog on Board Game Geek. If you're familiar with my blog, you'll know that it concerns um, what I'm interested in exploring the way that history is represented in uh, modern board games. My own area of specialization is the history of Atlantic slavery, its rise and demise. And so I um, am very interested in uh, board games from the last couple decades that have contended with this issue in some way. As the board game industry and hobby expands, we're seeing a broader and broader breadth of historical topics being taken on. And uh, uh, I think that we are in uh, a fascinating place. There are enough titles which, uh, uh, that deal with slavery in some fashion that we can begin to think about um, how board games interact with this history. So um, here are some thoughts on that. Um, there's a kind of a visual component here as I wanna try to lay these out on an X, Y axis. And that is why I'm doing this on video. So let's get right to it. So here's my axis. There's an X axis or horizontal axis. And that is about the degree to which a game does or does not acknowledge that slavery is represented in it. Right. So on the left hand side are games that um, are sort of about slavery in some fashion, but slavery is not acknowledged. And on the right are games that loudly declare themselves to be about slavery in some fashion. The vertical axis, the Y axis, is about whether the slavery that is presented in these games is presented as a um, um, uh, sort of a useful thing that can help you gain victory or whether uh, slavery is presented negatively. So this is kind of the effective or the evaluative uh, um, axis for this. On the top are games that, that loudly proclaim that slavery is a bad thing that should be punished and not rewarded on the bottom are games that might actually reward you for playing slavery in some fashion. And I'm going to set some of these games against this axis. We can start with uh, The Granddaddy. This is Puerto Rico, designed by Andreas Seyfarth, published in 2002. Um, and this is a game, this is the earliest of the games that we'll be considering here. This is a game that is sort of nominally about slavery or um, uh, kind of has to be about slavery, but slavery isn't named in it at all. So Puerto Rico is uh, a, a Euro game. And like many Euro games, it has a fairly thin connection between theme and the, and, and, uh, the mechanics in the box. Um, uh, the idea behind Puerto Rico is that um, players are plantation owners on the island and they are all going to be developing plantations that produce a variety of crops from um, corn, sugar, uh, indigo, tobacco, um, and uh, coffee. Um, and so these are slave grown crops. Uh, and if this game is referencing the plantation era of the Caribbean world, it has to be about slavery uh, in some fashion. Uh, and yet the game never uses the word slavery um, in its rule book. It doesn't reference slavery. It doesn't, there's no section of the rule book that talks much about what the game is there to represent. And this is in pretty much in keeping with that Euro game tendency to sort of be set in a particular past, but not be connected to it uh, that tightly. We see this in, in other kinds of Euro games about other, other sorts of topics. So in Puerto Rico, the um, plantation world of the Caribbean is a kind of generic backdrop. Um, and one em emblem of that is that Puerto Rico itself had a very odd um, or atypical experience of slavery of all the um, Caribbean slave societies. It was, it was not um, like Jamaica or Saint-Domingue or some of, the, some of the other more typical kinds of places. Slavery uh, was important very early on in the early 16th century, and then it kind of receded from Puerto Rico as, it, as slavery took hold in other places, and then it only reemerged as an important factor in Puerto Rico really in, in, the, 19th, um, in the 19th century. So uh, a pretty loose connection between the two, and as a consequence, 
it's not surprising then that Puerto Rico doesn't really contend too much with uh, slavery itself. Um, sometimes it is it is pointed out that um, the game may represent the presence of slaves in the form of these little brown tokens. Those tokens are termed colonists in the game. They are uh, placed on um, plantations and on uh, production buildings, uh, and you need uh, colonists on both. These brown tokens have been kind of infamous. The notion here is, is that, gee, we're, what are you doing with brown tokens, which could represent slaves, but you're calling them colonists? Um, in, in Safar's defense and defense of the game, uh, it could be said that those brown desks were used in previous designs of his that don't have anything to do with slavery or this particular history. Um, so there really isn't an effort to, um, to depict the enslaved or the slave experience uh, in this game, at least not overtly. Even the little brown discs that have become kind of the infamous feature of this game are not intended to be representations of slavery. So this is a game that um, falls way over on the left-hand side of this scale. It never acknowledges slavery, even though it kind of has to be uh, in there in some way. And it's on the bottom of this, uh, uh, the effective or the evaluative axis in the sense that uh, only, only by playing slavery can you win the game, right? You need these, quote, colonists uh, in order to produce goods. So here's a game that occupies that lower left-hand side of our spectrum. Another move up might be Glenn Drover's Age of Empires III. This is um, a game that's more broadly set uh, about the expansion of Europe, the exploration of new worlds, the conquest of, of those worlds if they're occupied by others, um, and the uh, implementation of economy, colonial economies, right, which is effectively going to mean slavery. Thing about Age of Empires 3 is that um, it does not deal with slavery like Puerto Rico. The difference, so it's over on the left-hand side of the spectrum. The reason why it's not all the way over to the left is that it does this very consciously. There's a section in the Age of Empires 3 rulebook, which I'll present right here, which um, reveals the designer's concerns about this. So we have a clear expression of uh, how slavery is intended to be represented or not represented in the game. And this is what Drover says, um, the Atlantic slave trade was one of the most horrific events in human history and just too politically sensitive to depict in any overt manner in a commercial product. Even though it certainly deserves to be discussed and remembered accurately, I felt that there was too much risk that the perception could be that the topic was being trivialized by having it in a game or that the game rewarded players for utilizing slavery. So that's an understandable perspective. Here the designer is um, concerned with um, the possibility that um, in this sort of uh, a medium, board games, which is understood to be light or trivial, um, that here's a topic that, that would clash with that. I would do it in a way that might, uh, the designer is fearful or concerned that players might understand that slavery was present in this game but was not being taken seriously. So rather than contend with that possibility, the designer just sort of designed it out of the game. That's a choice. And with every choice, there's always a good and a bad. So the good might be that, okay, we don't risk the claim that the designer is trivializing slavery. Um, on the other side, it might be claimed that a game that kind of has to be about slavery in some way, we're talking about the establishment of colonial empires, um, that if it fails to represent slavery, it is somehow um, permitting players to partake of this history without encountering this these difficult components of it. So this might be the, the claim, the argument here might be that this is a game that sort of whitewashes the issue of slavery by designing it out. Um, every player is going to have their own sort of judgment on how that goes, and I'm not here to, to, to stake out terrain. I just want to explain that that is a, a possibility here. So if you 
uh, include slavery, you might run the risk of appearing to trivialize it. If you don't include slavery, then you run the risk of looking like you might be trying to whitewash history. Uh, but what is useful here, at least, is we have a clear perspective from uh, the designer themselves about how slavery is to be represented. And this is a game, and so I put this above, um, on that y-axis, I put it above center because um, it's clear that the evaluation of slavery here is negative, right? The reason why the designers were concerned about putting it in was that they did not want to be seen to be endorsing um, an experience that they viewed as, as, as negative, right? One of the most horrific events in human history. So that's where we go with Age of Empires 3. Let's move on to games that begin to think uh, to at least present slavery a little more concretely. So there's three games here and I'm putting them all up. They occupy, I would, I would put them all basically where the center game is, Colonial here. These are three games that uh, are very similar in theme and they deal with slavery in fairly similar ways. Um, on the left, we have uh, Martin Wallace's Struggle of Empires. In the middle is Colonial, um, Europe's uh, overseas, uh, Europe's colonies over, uh, overseas expansion, and then Endeavor Age of Sail. Struggle of Empires and Endeavor, um, the editions that you see here are um, uh, new editions. Uh, they deal with slavery in slightly different ways than their previous ones, but for purposes of this discussion, I think we can just consider, consider these all um, as a group. And these are games where slavery is acknowledged, right? So they're there in the center to the right on that, on that X axis, on that horizontal axis. These are games where slavery uh, is represented in the mechanics of the game. Usually, it is represented, or in, the, in all three of these instances, what we get is um, what we might call a kind of incidental um, reference to slavery or representation of slavery. Players do not have to engage in slavery, but it is an option. And it's an option that tends to work in the same way. It is punished early on. Uh, I'm sorry, it is uh, a, a good thing to do early on if you want to grow your economy quickly. It is a, a way of sort of getting an early lead, but um, particularly in Colonial and Endeavor, uh, it is punished later in the game. So um, it's possible to, quote, play slavery in these games, um, though players are told by the game system itself that there is a cost to doing that. So there's a benefit to playing slavery, Early on, it might give you a kind of a lead or an access to resources that you wouldn't get otherwise. But um, uh, as the game goes on, and usually as economies develop, um, there is a point at which slavery turns into a, a negative. And I've written about these, uh, these games in a, in a blog post, so I won't go into too much detail here, but I will show you uh, how Endeavor copes with this in its rulebook. So there are these resource cards that you're trying uh, to get a hold of. The value of these cards is going to go up as you gain capacity and as the game goes on. And once you are able to get a five value card, once you're able to get to that level of economic development, um, it says the, th uh, uh, the value five card in Europe and the Mediterranean deck is special. It features a label that announces the abolition of slavery. The first time this card is drawn by any player, all players must immediately set aside all slavery cards they hold, reducing their status track scores as appropriate to reflect the lost icons. So um, the early resource benefit that slavery give you, gave you is going to go away. And then it says uh, the set aside slavery cards are turned face down and kept near the player's player board as a reminder that the player will lose one glory per card at the end of the game for resorting, resorting to slavery. 
Um, and so this is, of the three, this is the most punishing of the game. Struggle of Empires, it's, it's slavery. Practicing slavery is not really punished. It's just not enough to win the game. You could never win a game of Struggle of Empires by playing slavery. In Colonial, there's a similar feature where once you get to a certain level of economic development, um, as in history, that kicks in this, this um, abolition movement and slavery um, uh, well, there's there's a kind of a negative that that um, is associated with practicing slavery. So, um, but endeavor is the strongest one of these, and here you get this clear statement. Now, the, these are this is a statement that slavery is a bad thing, right? You can practice it, but it is going to cost you in the end. So the game is punishing you. Uh, for practicing slavery, and that's why it's uh, it's higher up there on that on that y-axis axis towards slavery is a negative. But it is something that you can play, um, and so it is sitting here in the center of of the track. Slavery is we might call this an incidental mechanic in these games. It's not something you must do. Um, but you have an option of doing it. So these games put players in a kind of interesting moral quandary. Are they going to uh, practice slavery, engage in it, um, and, and wrestle with its moral complexities as uh, the game develops down the road, or are they just going to evade it altogether? Another approach to um, acknowledging the role of slavery in games is taken by Freedom uh, Academy Games, Brian Mayer. Um, and in this game, what happens is um, players don't have an opportunity to engage in slavery. They have an opportunity to fight against slavery. So this is a game where um, players take on the roles of uh, African-American activists and white uh, abolitionists. And what they're trying to do is um, move enslaved people from the plantation south to the north and eventually to freedom in Canada. Uh, all the time they're doing this, they have to contend with uh, slave catchers, which are run by uh, elegant in-game artificial intelligence. Uh, they are encountering historical events on these cards. They're trying to raise money for the abolition movement, but really what they're trying to do is, is, is get people um, uh, moved to, to freedom. Um, so this is a game that is on that y-axis, very high up. Slavery is the opponent. It is something you are uh, actively fighting against rather than something you can partake of. And uh, it is very far over on the x-axis because slavery is not incidental in this game. It is, uh, in fact, uh, what the game is about. So I can imagine, uh, so this is a really interesting take on this whole sort of social problem of whether we want to play games that um, uh, allow us to play slavery. Uh, here is a game that lets us contend with the historical reality of slavery without being given the option or perhaps the temptation of engaging it in it in some way. So, uh, and it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fascinating, I think it's a really a path breaking game in a lot of ways because um, uh, this is an overtly educational game. Academy Games tends to produce educational games. There's a curriculum that you can buy along with this game so you can use it in classrooms or study it at home. Um, and it is, uh, so it is an educational game, but it also, it's, it's just a fine Euro style game, right? Like many other, it is a good example of modern board game technology. This one uses a cooperative mechanic. So it beautifully marries its mechanics to the theme, right? Instead of working against each other to free slaves, we're all working together against the system. That is the central move that permits slavery to be in this game with without putting players in a morally compromised um, situation. And so Freedom is the first of three games that we can look to that uh, are of this mold, where the game is about slavery and slavery is the bad thing you are fighting against.
Pax Emancipation is a, uh, an, uh, another more recent entrant into, uh, into this, um, this market. Um, in Pax Emancipation, players are uh, representing um, three different sectors of um, British institutions. You're either parliament, philanthropists, or missionaries. And um, in this game, your project uh, is you also start working cooperatively. You can wind up um, being competitive in the second stage of the game. But you're doing, um, in this game, nothing less than trying to eradicate slavery across the globe. So this is a game with a, an enormously broad expanse of space. Um, we're looking at essentially the um, late 18th and entire 19th centuries across the entire globe. This is a heavy game. It's very rich mechanically. Uh, as you can see by some of the cards here, there's a, a lot of text, a lot of detail, a lot of what we might call discursive rhetoric that is designed to help explain the game and what it is about. Um, and this lets the game make a pretty powerful historical argument about the uh, ideological sources of anti-slavery, the connection between slavery and um, democratic revolution, uh, and some related concepts. Uh, the whole Western tradition of rights is incorporated in, in here. It's really a, a remarkable bit of design engineering. The argument that it makes is, uh, in my view, highly problematic. Um, I believe it um, slights the agency of the enslaved, that it understands slavery in highly problematic ways, and that its depictions of history don't align very effectively with modern academic uh, historical interpretations of the past that it represents. Um, and so I've, I've spent considerable time in other places on this blog exploring or laying out my concerns with this, uh, with this game. But for all my problems with it, it is a notable entrant in this um, group of games that speaks about slavery. And one of the things I think that Pax Emancipation taught me was that it is possible to make complicated, powerful um, uh, historical arguments through games. That for designer Phil Eklund, game mechanics really are the medium through which he is trying to make a case. Um, I think that case is, is highly problematic, but what we get here is a strong sense of possibility. Games can take on these issues in powerful and complicated ways. The last of these games that I want to consider here is Tom Russell's This Guilty Land, um, which is published by Holland Spiel. Tom Russell is, um, as I understand, mostly a uh, war game designer. Uh, and This Guilty Land is, um, is a title that it's, it's a bit of a, of a, of a niche game. Um, Pax Emancipation 2 is a kind of a niche game. Um, Phil Eklund and Sierra Madre Games uh, have a whole sort of following built around their series of Pax games. Um, whereas freedom is something that you would find, uh, you, you might be able to find in stores or it's, it's easily available uh, online. It's less of a, of a niche product. <clears throat> but this guilty land is an interesting entrant into this market. It makes an argument that is far less troubled than Pax Emancipations is. And it is a sparer design. It's, it's not as heavy, even though it is still a very thoughtful game. And so what I understand this Guilty Land to be a game that is, uh, of those presented here, the most powerful example of a ludic historical argument, right? An argument about history made through game mechanics. This is a game where, um, that announces that it is very much against slavery, but it does allow a player to play slavery. This is a two-sided game. Um, one player plays the side of, uh, quote, justice, which is the anti-slavery side, and the other side plays the red, 
side of oppression or pro-slavery. Uh, so it's a game that lets you uh, engage in slavery, but it is very, very clear um, just by labeling the positions, if by nothing else, so that you can see the images on the cover speak, you know, they, everything about this game suggests that um, uh, designer Russell believes that slavery is a bad thing and um, it is what you what you you know should be fighting against so the kind of offsetting move this is a game where it is possible to play slavery but that is kind of offset by the game's clear denunciation of the institution right nobody can uh, reasonably look at this game it's 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 title um, read the rule book it's um uh, the images, um, the names of the positions. No one can encounter this game and reasonably conclude that uh, its designer is not condemning slavery. Um, yet still, it, it, is, it is possible to play. And in this game, what you're doing is, uh, the, the setting here is uh, antebellum US politics. So we're looking at um, the decades before the American Civil War. And you can see on this uh, on this map that um, you've got these red and uh, blue markers, and they're regionally divided. And essentially, what you're doing in this game is each side is fighting for um, regional control of the politics. So as you can see, the Deep South is is controlled by the red forces of oppression, whereas in New England or the Middle Atlantic states, forces of justice right now are um, are are ascendant. But what you're trying to do is shift those around so that because each region is going to give you votes in the Senate and House of Representatives, and those are going to let you. Um, uh, act on these laws that are appearing in the lower right hand part of, of this image. And that's how you really get points. You want to, you, you've got, you know, Tariffs, Fugitive Slave Act, Anti Federalism, Expansion of Slavery. These are the issues that are going to give you the points. Uh, but to get them, you're going to need political control of these, of these regions. It's a fascinating and important argument that very closely details the way um, anyone would teach a college level history class on say antebellum politics of slavery. Um, because it was of course the case that the country was, was fiercely divided over slavery. In fact, um, slavery, its champions, its representatives, its proponents tended to dominate the national government uh, up into the 1850s. Um, and it was really forces of anti-slavery that had to kind of figure out a way to intrude upon the political system and force the issue on the agenda of a political system that did not want to contend with slavery because it was a sectionally divisive issue which threatened to split the political parties. So what we're getting in this game is an effort to represent the politics of slavery and make a historical argument about the politics of slavery, that it was, a, it was really about um, uh, establishing your influence regionally, getting command of the political structure so that you could move forward pieces of legislation that favored your side over another. Uh, and so this is a game, unlike Pax Emancipation, which I have a big problem with its um, historical argument, this is a game that the historical argument of which is much more in keeping with um, the standard scholarship on this. So um, I, it is, it is uh, I can imagine other things being in this game, like we don't have political parties in this game, um, but it is not designed to do everything with respect to slavery. It's designed to uh, make a uh, concise set of points about politics and slavery. And in that regard, there's there's really nothing like it. It is um, mechanically a little bit denser and richer than um, freedom, perhaps. Um, although I imagine that's an, an, uh, an arguable statement. Um, but here we get uh, a, a, an effort to engage um, a historical argument that is, I think, the most powerful ludic example that we've seen here. Okay, so that, um, that does it. Uh, here is a ludography of these games. 
Um, this is a fascinating subject. I would imagine that we are going to be getting more games that uh, contend with this issue uh, or simply more games that um, are capable of grappling with complicated historical subjects uh, on sort of ludic terms, that these are games built into the mechanics uh, are, as some kind of connection with slavery. I'll be very excited to see um, how this field sort of broadens and expands uh, as we move forward. Thanks for watching. I hope you find this useful. If you do, please don't hesitate to comment below.